My name is Bill McGarvey. I'm a culture columnist for America Magazine and the author of The Freshman Survival Guide, soulful advice for studying, socializing, and everything in between. Even the most casual observers today will be aware of an incredible paradox that has emerged at the center of public conversation about religion and culture. The fact is undeniable that one of the most prominent religion stories of the past decade isn't actually about religion at all. Spiritual, but not religious, has become such an integral part of the lexicon that pollsters who study religion now include it as a separate category in their questionnaires. It's such a big category, in fact, that spiritual but not religious now constitutes 7% of the American population. As a group, they are bigger than atheists and much bigger than Jews, Muslims, and Episcopalians. Who are these people, and what is this, this distinction that they are making between religion and spirituality? Of course, the reason for the rise of this new category isn't easily reduced to a single factor. But in my experience, one of the biggest distinctions those who consider themselves spiritual but not religious make has to do with relevance. How are the institutional faith communities relevant to their lives? How does the doctrinal rigidity and moral certitude that they associate with traditional organized religion intersect with the incredibly complex, dynamic, and fluid world they experience every day of their lives through their family, their workplace, and their relationships. In short, for a growing number of people, the living word of scripture is not all that alive. For any number of reasons, or very often because of direct per personal experiences, they don't see the connection between institutions, doctrines, and theology, and the life of faith. Instead, they need to encounter God personally through their own lives. In some ways, it's not unlike Thomas, who needed to see Jesus in the flesh before he could believe he was resurrected. How many of us, even the most devout, don't long for that sort of evidence in our own lives of faith? How many of us find ourselves to be like the man in Mark's gospel who brought his son to Jesus to be healed, saying, Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. Ironically, Scripture itself speaks to this need. For those of us who struggle to recognize the divine in Scripture or tradition, a better starting point might be to find the Word of God in our life experiences first. St. Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, offers us a litmus test for helping us understand how and where God is working in our lives. In the fifth chapter of Galatians, Paul tells us that, quote, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It is never easy to understand just how God is at work in our complicated lives. Where is God calling me when I'm forced to decide between a number of seemingly good options? Where is he when I'm forced to choose between the lesser of two evils? For some, the question is not how God is at work, but if he is at work at all. When we struggle to comprehend where God is in our lives, or when we find it difficult to understand what relevance religious institutions have, or whether belief is relevant at all, we could do worse than consulting a standard that has stood the test of time for over 2,000 years and is at the core of the understanding of the Holy Spirit. Do the relationships in our lives, the work we do, the goals we set for ourselves, bear good fruit? Do they bring about greater love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? If they do, you can probably trust that God is at work.